All right, everybody, let's get started. Hello and welcome to today's live video call from a dinosaur dig. My name is Chris Smith and I work here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences as the coordinator for current science programs. Uh, it's good to be with you all for another edition of our summer paleontology field series where we check in with the museum's paleontology crew to see how things are going out at their dig sites this summer where they are exploring the west looking for dinosaurs and other uh, fossil evidence of ancient ecosystems in North America. And joining me now is the museum's head of paleontology all the way in New Mexico, Dr. Lindsay Zano. Hi, Lindsay. Hey, everyone. How are you doing today? Oh, we're doing great. We, uh, we're having a really great field season. Lots of, lots of amazing things happening. Lots of things going better than expected. So yeah, lots to talk about. Lots of updates for you guys. Oh, that's, that's really great. Uh, I know we had talked to you a couple of weeks ago and things were going pretty good for you, except for some pretty rough weather, but you were in a different part of New Mexico then. Uh, it looks like you've got uh, good weather today. Yeah, well, last time we chatted, uh, we had been in the San Juan Basin, which is northwestern New Mexico, uh, working on dinosaurs from the Menifee Formation, which is about, uh, give or take, 82 million years old or so. Uh, and it was a completely different landscape, you know, um, beautiful carved badlands, dry as a bone, no plant life out there. Um, pretty chilly, actually not so hot, but we were experiencing pretty major sandstorms on a regular basis out there. Um, we had a really wicked one come through camp, uh, just a few days before we ended up packing up probably 50 mile an hour winds. It was really intense. So, uh, we actually ended up staying in the Menifee for longer than we thought we would, because last time we talked, we had just opened up a new dinosaur quarry. Chris, you remember? I do, yeah. And we didn't know, yeah. We didn't know what we had yet, and everybody was asking, yeah. "What is it? What is it?" And we had we had just uncovered a couple bones, and we weren't sure. But uh, just a day or so after we talked, we um, we uncovered part of the pelvis, and uh, is a horned dinosaur, uh, a single juvenile individual of a horned dinosaur, like a ceratopsian type dinosaur. Um, amazing preservation most of the skeleton there in this one site and so um it was a really joy to be there and be working on that site because the bone was so beautiful uh, and we knew it could also be wow. a new a new species so we decided to stay wow. a little bit longer we stayed for about an extra five days and pulled about 60 bones or so out of that quarry from that skeleton before we ended up shutting down and moving to where we are now Oh my gosh, what a find. That's incredible. Yeah, it's great. There were some skull, um, a fully articulated pelvis, both hips and a spine running through. There were limb bones for Bray. Uh, it's going to be a really amazing site. We didn't finish it, but we got a, enough to bring back to the museum to do some preparation in the lab, figure out if it's a new animal or not, come back next year and finish it off. So tell me again, you said you pulled out about 60 bones. Is it mostly like vertebrae, hips, legs, or do you have most of a skeleton? Do you have the good parts? Uh, we have some skull bones and the hips, parts of the legs, parts of the arms, some vertebrae. So it's kind of spread out. Um, yeah, part of the frill as well. So great site, super exciting. Um, of course, that'll happen after our helicopter lift. So we had to carry all those jackets out by hand, uh, including a big one down a, a kind of narrow, steep canyon. That was a lot of fun on the last day. So ended up being a great site. You couldn't get the helicopter to come back for another hit, huh? <laughs> no, no, we, uh, we get that one chance and that, that's it. We got to wait for next year or so. Well, this is really exciting, especially since I know that... Uh, one of your paleontology members, uh, Eric Lund, is a fan of the horned dinosaurs. 
Yeah, one member of our staff, our team, Eric Lund, uh, is a horned dinosaur expert. And so two of the sites that we were working in the Menifee were horned dinosaur sites. So he was really happy about that. Um, we found some tyrannosaur bits, uh, you know, chunks of the feet about this big around. So big tyrannosaurs, teeth, um, maybe some bits of an ankylosaur and most of the skeleton of a, a really large duckbill dinosaur as well. So we loaded about 2,500 pounds worth of jackets in a truck that Eric already brought back to the museum. So that stuff's already there. And then we have about another 500 pounds of jackets that we've ended up keeping with us for now and uh, won't go back to the museum until the end of this summer. Exciting stuff. It'll be exciting to see them when they get into the lab and uh, then to see what you can learn from them. Yeah, we're, we're really excited to see if any of these uh, critters are new, new species. There, there should be a fair number of different species of horned dinosaur in the formation. Usually there's multiple species living together at the same time in the same place. And so we're hopeful we have something new and different. Now, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by you and your team's ability to, to like all of a sudden find, find some, a new site, dig them out and just sort of, I mean, you're looking at them while you're digging them out, but to be able to look at them and go, this could be something new that it, that it clicks that easily for you. Well, you know, field IDs are notoriously uh, unreliable. <laughs> a lot of times we think we have something and then we get it back and we prep it and it's, you know, something different. But, uh, you know, all the formations that we're working in are, are fairly poorly known. So there's a lot of animals out there that haven't been uh, discovered or described yet. And so the probability of finding something new is very high in all these places that we're working, which makes it very exciting. That's really exciting. So uh, you're at a new site now. You were in the Menifee. Tell us a little bit about the Moreno Formation. Yeah, so we packed up camp um, about three or four days ago and drove about two and a half hours south uh, from, from the San Juan Basin. We're now in the Zuni Basin. Um, and in this area, we're working a uh, rock formation known as the Moreno Hill Formation. So whereas the Menifee was about 82-ish million years or Campanian aged, We've moved backward in time about 10 million years here. So we're about 91, 92 million years where we are now. So you can see we're just sort of stepping back in time, trying to fill in that story. And a uh, completely different environment. This is a pinon juniper forest, woodland kind of environment. Um, a mountain bluebird just came over and sat and checked me out for a little bit earlier while I was setting up for you guys. That was really cool. Oh, wow. And I don't know if you can hear, but the entire forest is filled with cicadas right now that are all singing. Um, oh, wow. So very interesting. At night, you can hear them in the trees clicking and, and they make sort of a chewing sound, which is pretty unnerving, actually. And <clears throat> as you're hiking through here, they sort of get startled and, and squeal and fly out of the of the pinon into your face. And you're it's kind of like a house of horrors walking through this, <laughs> walking through these woodlands right now. But um but a much, you know, wetter environment, forested environment here where we are. Okay. Uh, tell me the, the age of the rock you're working in again. This Moreno Hill formation here is about, it's about 91 million years old, 92 million years old. So, and about 10 million years older than the last sets of dinosaurs we were excavating. Okay. So, so you're being kind of strategic <laughs> about picking these sites in order to get different ages so that you can find new and different species. Is that right? Yeah, well, what we're trying to do is, is get a, a picture of the ecosystems, you know, at a regular interval so we can see how they were changing over time as a result of climate change that was happening here in the central North America at the time. So even though it's a dry desert, you know, environment right now, 92 million years ago, this was actually a delta front. So similar to say Louisiana or a lot in some ways like coastal North Carolina, uh, you had swamps and, you know, it was a very wet environment back then. Um, and very poorly known, there's only a handful of dinosaurs that have been named 
uh, from this formation. It's very difficult to find bone here. Um, we've been working here about six years um, and have dug, you know, bits of turtle, duckbill dinosaur, a little bit of theropod dinosaur. Uh, we have two sites we're working on this year. One of which I'm very happy to report we opened we opened it yesterday. We took all the overburden off, and they did find a dentary or a, a lower jaw in that site. So there's skull material there, which is great because when you're working on duckbill dinosaurs, you really need skulls to be able to sort out which species it might be. So that was really really exciting. You know, members of the crew came running into camp last night, all thrilled that they had found some skull stuff. Um, so so good good material out here. It's going really really well. So do you expect then that a lot of what you might be finding will be new species or very well could be since it's not a well-studied area? Yeah, and we have a geologist out with us, um, a PhD student who's doing his uh, dissertation on the geology here. And actually, this area that we're working, it may be about a million years younger than the area where all the dinosaurs are known from. And a million years is, you know, usually kind of a rough guess for how quickly species turn over and become something different. So we may be sampling uh, an ecosystem that's about a million years younger than, than the dinosaurs that are named from here. And so probably then uh, we may find new species in this area. Oh, wow. Fascinating. Very, that's really cool that uh, like all this stuff could just be totally new to paleontology just by looking at a slightly different area, which I'll say, yeah. I'm slightly surprised uh, that, you know, like a two and a half hour drive south from where you were before would yield like dr dramatic differences, uh, maybe even over the time scales. Like it's, would things, do you think things really change that much uh, in the span of a few million years in that part of the world? Oh, absolutely. Um, what's going on back, if you could travel back into the Turonian, this is this uh, geologic interval that is about 92 million years ago. If you could travel back then, you know, what was going on at the time was that a, a large seaway was moving into and spreading across the center of North America. And there was also a mountain range on the other side of the seaway. So all the dinosaurs that were living in this area were sort of stuck between rising mountains to the west and a seaway to the east. And so their habitat, as the seaway is sort of moving in and out through time, their habitat keeps getting compressed and their populations keep getting fragmented. And so you end up with very high species turnover. You know, that, that's, that's a good recipe for a lot of evolution when you have species being separated from one another and then um, changing up their landscape. And so species turnover during this time in North America would, would have been very, very high in a million years is certainly plenty of time for a new species to evolve. Excellent stuff. Well, uh, a couple of questions have come in on the chat. So I'm going to turn there. The first one came in from a user named Terry Gates, who asks, do you find a different number of fossils in the different places? Yeah, uh, where we were when we spoke last time, Chris, up in the Menifee, there's just bone everywhere. And the, the challenge in the Menifee is finding a nice skeleton. You can find bits of bone all over the place, but it's just isolated elements, just, you know, uh, a toe bone here, a vertebrae there, and there's nothing else. Um, here in the Moreno Hill, when we find bone, it's typically a decent site. It's just very, very, very hard to find anything. Um, and so especially it's very pocketed. So like this one area I'm sitting in right now, we've, we've got a lot of sites right here, but then we've prospected for years, just a mile, you know, north and south of here and found nothing anywhere. So you kind of get these little pockets of bone in the Moreno Hill. So it's every area that you go to, it's different. Finding the fossils is a different process and you have to kind of get to know the area you're working. Excellent question. The next one uh, from Mary, do you find many small theropod animals? In general, it, not here and not in general. So small theropods are among the hardest to find. Their bones are very hollow and thin. So they don't, 
preserve well in the fossil record, they often get destroyed um, before they can fossilize. And uh, it's also harder to find a small skeleton just as a person uh, out prospecting. I mean, you have to remember that that we only find what we see. And so if you have a huge bone or a huge skeleton, you're more likely to spot it than you are something really tiny in this kind of environment. You can kind of see behind me, there's, there's cobbles littering the ground and, and, you know, there's all kinds of things that you have to keep your eye out for to, to find those pieces of bone. So they were here, they were uh, all kinds of different small theropod, feathered theropod dinosaurs that would have been all over this place, but, but we're just, it's very, very difficult to find them. But you know that they were there, so there's at least some evidence. Is it just a matter of finding a new spot to, to search for that maybe you get lucky at? How much do you keep looking before you give up on them? Uh, well, <laughs> well, I never give up on them because small theropods are my favorite. Um, there and that's the go. thing that I, I like to work on. Um, one of the ways you can pick up the fact that small theropods are here is if you have a what's called a microvertebrate locality. So it's a, it's a place where tiny fossils are accumulating. And so you'll find a layer of tiny, tiny fossils. And usually that's teeth. And things like fish scales or fish teeth and spines, um, lizards, mammal teeth, um, even frog material, salamander material. But you also will find dinosaur teeth. And teeth preserve very, very well. So if you can find a nice microvertebrate layer, you can get a really nice snapshot of the whole ecosystem. Um, but just the tiny stuff. Oh, okay, I see. Very interesting. All right, more from the chat here. Uh, Michael wants to know if you found dinosaurs in the southeastern U.S., like Mississippi, Alabama, or Tennessee. And another good question is, yeah, why are you out west looking for dinosaurs? Yeah, so, no, I haven't found any out there because I don't work in that area. There. But I have been involved in describing some. For example, we just submitted two papers on... Um, a dinosaur called an ornithomimid from Mississippi. Uh, and it was found in a, a creek bed. So the problem, there's a couple of problems with finding dinosaurs in the southeastern U.S. One is that the environment wasn't very good for preserving them in the first place. Um, out here, when I, when I told you you had the mountains to the west and the seaway, what you have is a lot of sediment coming off those mountains and burying things that are living here. So you get a lot of dinosaurs buried and preserved in the fossil record. You don't have that same situation on the East Coast. Um, so most dinosaurs didn't get preserved in the first place. It sounded like the wind was picking up, and I think it just blew our signal away. We'll give, we'll give uh, Dr. Zano a moment to catch back up and get reconnected. But just in case this happens, everybody, I can introduce you to uh, Lisa Herzog, who's the paleontology lab manager. Although maybe Lindsay is back with us. We'll give it a second. Yep, so Lisa, I'm back. Oh, hey, okay. Perfect. That was fast. Hey. So where, where did I lose you in my explanation? Uh, you were uh, describing dinosaurs from a creek in Mississippi and uh, the southeastern U.S. doesn't have the, the geological history to cover up, to leave sediment to cover dinosaurs. Did we lose you again, Lindsay? If not, we can talk to Lisa about uh, some fossil turtles, which I know are Lisa's favorite. I heard that there were some turtles coming out of the, the formations there. Yeah, last year when we were, I worked the Moreno Hill formation 
um, we were working a turtle quarry that we found uh, a couple years ago and pulled a lot of turtle material out of there. Um, turtles tend to die and kind of their shells break up and then we collect them um, in pieces and then hopefully we can piece them back together when we get in the lab. And so I'm trying to, to uh, process that stuff now. We're trying to rebuild a turtle shell. It's kind of like doing a puzzle. Um, and I'm trying to find just the right volunteer to help me put that back together again, because we have a lot of pieces of it. It's really well preserved, but in, in a lot of pieces. We're going to try to describe that turtle as well once we get it all figured out. I see Lynn so you trying to get connected, but yeah, go ahead. So you've been out to this site. Uh, how do you feel about it? It seems like a gorgeous place to do some field work. It's a very beautiful area to work. Um, I'm kind of missing being out there this year. Um, I opted not to go to the Moreno Hill this year because I'm working other quarries. So I'll be on the next stint. Um, we're going to be moving camp to uh, Utah after they're done where they're at. And then I'll join the crew in Utah and work uh, the Crystal Geyser Quarry. So we've got a very long field schedule uh, organized. Lindsay put it all together and people are coming in and going out and it's a lot of organizing. Um, but we're going to be collecting a lot of really good, important things while we're out there, for sure. That's, and, uh, are you that. back, Lindsay? Do you want to finish your uh, explanation? I, I don't know what you heard, so um, I can or we can move on. Chris, up to you. You're the host. I'm going to take us on to the next question. Okay. I, I think I think we got the gist of it. Dinosaurs are a little trickier to find in the southeast, and a little <laughs> easier to find out west. That's the a, next that, one that, I've, that that about sums it up. Yeah. This. <laughs> oh, let's see. Leo wants to know what's the oldest fossil you found. What's the oldest fossil I have found? Well, I mean, when I was first starting out as an undergrad, you know, we would go collect invertebrates for some of our college classes. And so um, probably, you know, stuff that was um, much, much older, about 100 million years older than the earliest dinosaurs. But um, as, as a scientist, really the, the oldest stuff that I've worked on is late Jurassic stuff. So about 150 million years old or so. Very cool. Uh, and, you know, you just kind of mentioned uh, your early career in paleontology and a question came in uh, from a young viewer. Did you know when you were a kid that this is what you wanted to be? No, not really. I mean, as a kid, I loved nature. I loved art and I loved science. Um, and I think there are a lot of different pathways you can take. Um, but I ended up sort of getting inspired to study paleontology um, in my late, let's see, right after high school or so and in my college years. And then I started having experiences with paleontologists in the field uh, out West, actually here in New Mexico, where I did my undergraduate work. And so, no, I wasn't like, it, this wasn't a straight and narrow path. And I think that's good. I think it's good to explore your interests and, and see what really gets you excited when you think about what you want to do for a career. Yeah, I think there are, there are a lot of young people. I was one of them. You sort of get interested in dinosaurs at a young age. Just one of these things that seems to happen. Uh, and then you, you find yourself in all kinds of career paths. Like, you know, maybe you work in a science museum, but you just get to talk to the scientists who are actually doing the cool dinosaur work. Or you get, or you don't think you're going to work in a science museum, and then you end up being the head of paleontology. Yeah, and there's lots of ways you can participate. You know, you can also volunteer for the museum and help clean and, and conserve fossils. You can volunteer to help collect fossils in the field. Um, there are lots of ways to be involved, even if um, an actual academic or scientific pathway is not what you end up choosing. I love that. Yeah. Uh, when we were talking to Lisa, she was mentioning that she's going to try to find a volunteer to put a turtle back together. So lots of options. OK, let's see. Uh, 
more questions from the chat. Oh, Lindsay, I don't know. Okay, well, I'll ask you this one anyway. Do we have prehistoric sea reptiles? I don't know sea reptiles. Uh, do we have, do we have, did you mean, did they live on planet earth? Yes. There were lots of yes. reptiles that lived in the sea, but, um, we don't have any marine rocks right where I am right now, but, um, you can definitely find a lot of cool marine fossils in New Mexico and across the Southwest. Okay. Interesting. Do we, uh, have any here at our museum? Um, yeah, we have some, yes, we have some teeth, not a lot of material, some teeth and maybe some isolated vertebrae of some marine reptiles. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I'll remind folks, we're going to, we'll chat for a few more minutes. If you've got questions, you can drop them in the chat on YouTube or in the comments on Facebook. Uh, and we'll be here for a little bit more. Uh, Mary wants to know if you found any flying reptiles oh like pterosaurs um i found a couple years ago i found some bone out here that i thought might have been pterosaur but it was just bits pterosaur bone is almost paper thin so it's it's very hard to preserve and it's very hard to find but yeah i think i have found a couple of bits of potential pterosaur out here mm -hmm. oh fun fun stuff that these formations, they, uh, they seem to just keep giving every year you go out. That's true, huh? Yeah, and it, we have trouble walking away once we get started. We always think we're going fit, to we'll finish a quarry and then we're going to wrap up in an area, but we're always finding something before we go that we feel like we need to come back and work on. So, um, so it's pretty addictive and, you know, it never seems to end, really. There's just more and more stuff to keep working on. And so when you go out to, say, New Mexico and you're, you're looking around, do you have that uh, hypothesis or that question in mind that, you know, you would want to find the fossils to try to help answer that you would then bring back and write up? Or what, what's kind of or the process that would send you? Yeah, out? I mean, that's... Ex that's exactly it, Chris, is that we have, we have some questions that we're working on, and these are grant-funded questions by the National Science Foundation that's funding our work. And, um, you know, what we're trying to do is, is get enough material of all the different types of animals that lived in each one of these time windows uh, so that we can understand how the communities uh, were connected, what those ecosystems look like, and how they change through time. So we're looking for um, filling in all the missing biodiversity that we can. And then at sort of the end of the project, we'll take all those time snapshots and we'll study how those ecosystems changed and why, and hopefully draw some connections between the climate change that was happening at the time and the patterns of evolution and biodiversity and ecology in this area during the Cretaceous. Very interesting. So uh, in the process of collecting the, the fossils, the bone, do you also collect other, other things, maybe like other rocks um, or sediment that might be there to help you put together how the climate was changing? So like you've talked about the climate is changing over these millions of years. What's the evidence for that? And do you bring some of that back as well? Yeah, that's absolutely right, Chris. What we have out here is a team of geochemists. So these are people who study the chemistry um, through geology, the rock record. We have um, climatologists, paleoclimatologists that study how the climate changed. We have geologists. And then we have a whole group of different paleontologists with different expertise, some in mammals, some in dinosaurs, um, you know, as well as invertebrates, some in invertebrates, and some botanists, some people who uh, are reconstructing the plants in these ecosystems as well. So when we're out here, we're collecting rock samples to um, understand things like temperature and precipitation. You can actually get the, those data from the rocks, depending on the type of rock that you have. We're also collecting rock samples so we can get an age. So we wanna know exactly what age um, these dinosaurs lived in. And, and exactly, you know, when I say 82 million years, we wanna know it's 82, not 83, not 84. 
and the rocks uh, can preserve little crystals from volcanic eruptions that can tell you exact ages. Uh, and then we're also collecting the fossil pollen and the fossil plants and then all the different animals, like I said. And so it's a whole team that's come together to really piece together all the aspects of this story. That is an impressive team that you've got out there in New Mexico. And you're in charge yeah, well, of the whole it, thing. It, well, well, no, it's a collaboration. And, um, you know, it takes, that's what it takes to do big picture science, right? It takes um, people coming together and bringing all their different expertise together and, and doing what they couldn't do alone. And so for this grant that we're working on, you know, we have five different institutions with different experts in all these systems. But, but you're right, when we're out here, we're collecting samples for everybody so that together we can piece together the story. Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> well, I, I love everything about that. That is fabulous. Um, let's see here. When you get a permit for an area, how long is the permit valid? Can you just collect forever? That depends on the... That just depends on the area. Usually it's only one year. So we have to go through a very rigorous, intensive process every single year to renew all of our permits. And every time we find a new location that we think might be good for a quarry, we can only collect uh, from about a meter on the surface. And then we have to evaluate if we think it's a good site and we think there's more bone in the hill. And then we have to start a new excavation permit. Uh, with the federal government, and they will send a team of experts out to evaluate if there be any impact to the ecosystem, to the endangered plants and animals, to archaeology, and all those people have to come to our site and check it out uh, before they'll authorize us to actually dig a hole in the ground out here. And this is the uh, Eagle Peak Wilderness uh, area. So this there's a lot of wildlife. There's bears and cougars and other things. And there's other scientific teams um, evaluating the ecosystem out here, the modern ecosystem. And so we have to be careful to do as little disturbance as we can. Oh, that's fascinating. So uh, just everybody out there working in the same areas to piece together every bit of these ecosystems from start to finish. Yeah, both the, both the ancient one that's at the surface here and the, and the living one. And it's great to think that the, the work that you and the team that you're working with do out there contributes to the science of the folks who are studying ecosystems as they are today. Like it's, it's kind of one unbroken chain of science to, to understand the history of the earth. Yeah, it absolutely is. You need that perspective of how things got to be the way they are by looking through the past and, and piecing together that entire story, because this is just one moment in time, right? In 4 billion years of, of life's history. So yeah, uh, there's a lot more people working on today than there are paleontologists. We have to cover the other 4 billion years, but uh, <laughs> But, but we're having a good time and we're having a very successful season so far. What's been the, the best part of being out at the Moreno Hill Formation so far? Oh, uh, I think that the, the discovery of Skull in that quarry yesterday was definitely the, the highlight so far. Um, it's, it's a difficult quarry. The bone is not preserved well. You know, it's, um, it's very soft and powdery. So we're hoping as we get deeper into the hill where there hasn't been as much weathering, the bone will be in better condition. But honestly, skulls are really difficult to find. Oh, you know, most of the time, you know, four to five times we find no skull material at our sites. Um, and skulls are what you need for these horned and duck-billed dinosaurs. So having a skull is, is just amazing. And we're really, really excited about it. What's your least favorite part of being at the Moreno Hill Formation? I don't like these cicadas flying into me when I'm hiking. I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite startling. You know, I keep my hair up so they don't get stuck in there and, and freak me out. But, uh, but other than that, the weather's gorgeous. It's beautiful. You know, it hasn't, it hasn't rained a drop in the month our team has been out here, which is pretty scary for the, for the Southwest right now. Um, but for 
for the work we're trying to do, it's great because we get slowed down a lot when it rains. And so we're getting a lot of work done and we're being very efficient. And so it's kind of a plus and a minus, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, so how much longer will you be at this site before you pack up camp and head to the next one? Uh, we pack up on the 12th. So nine more days here. We're kind of in and out, smash and grab, get as much stuff as we can from these two quarries um, in the short period of time that we have here. And then the next place we go will be central Utah. So this will be our last stop in New Mexico. We'll head over to central Utah where we have a, a mass death quarry that I've been working for 20 years. That's still producing um, baby new material of baby dinosaurs and skull material we've never seen before and a new species of sauropod and all kinds of great stuff even after 20 years of working that site. So, so the next live stream will be from central Utah. From central Utah and that folks will be Thursday, June 23rd. Third. So go ahead and mark your calendars. You too, Lindsay, to, to be with us uh, for Thursday, June 23rd at noon. And we'll check in again with the paleontology field team then. Although, Lindsay, will, it, will we have uh, you on the stream then or will we have another member of your team? Oh, we'll we have another yet? member of the team, Lisa Herzog, who's our operations manager. She's the, uh, the guru, keeps everything running on the, for the paleo unit. She'll be in charge of that quarry. Um, and so she'll be coming to you live uh, from the CGQ quarry. Excellent. We'll look forward to that. That'll be great. Uh, so, folks, thanks for tuning in to today's update from our paleontology field team. Lindsay, thanks for calling in and hiking up the biggest hill in New Mexico to talk to us. <laughs> Always a pleasure. It was great to talk to you guys. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully have some more exciting updates when everybody checks in with us in June. In the meantime, folks, uh, if you're active on social media, you can follow Dr. Zano and the team at Expedition Live on Twitter, where they're posting when they have cell service, posting awesome pictures and video. <laughs> uh, so you can follow along the expedition regularly there. I encourage you to do that. Uh, and you can also follow the Museum of Natural Sciences on social media to keep up with their work and everything else that's happening here at the museum. It's a great big place. We're at Natural Sciences on all the social medias. Uh, and then naturalsciences.org. You can hit up the website to find the future YouTube links for this program. That way you can go ahead and bookmark them. Uh, or, you know, just subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel and click the bell to get notified when we go live. And then you'll get the notification and you can come and join us for the latest, greatest updates in the dinosaur world. So, folks, uh, we're going to go out. Actually, Lindsay, we're going to uh, wrap up the call with video of the helicopter lift. Can you set that one up for us? And then we'll say our goodbyes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We um, we had the great fortune a helicopter take about 2,500 pounds of dinosaur bones in plaster jackets off the hill for us. And we got to ride in the helicopter up to the top of the hill, which was a lot, a lot of fun. And so um, some cool video of that. Enjoy. It's always great to have a helicopter and not have to carry things by hand. But for the rest of the season, we're going to be doing it the old fashioned way. You're hauling it out by hand. Well, Lindsay, good luck. Stay safe. And, uh, We'll see you soon. Thanks, Chris. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next time.